you are a real estate investor or you want to be a real estate investor and you want more money to fund your deals, regardless of what your banker or your broker or your hard money lender says, you're at the right place. I'm getting ready to plug you into the money. Well, welcome to the show. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, and welcome to Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. Another episode that we're broadcasting today, and I'm so glad to have you on. If you're first time uh, to the show, uh, we talk all things about real estate investing, uh, primarily talking about single family houses. Uh, as a real estate investor, you know, how to find the deals, how to get them funded and et cetera. And I've got a special guest again here on the show with me today, but before I bring him on here, uh, let me go ahead and take a moment and tell you what I was talking about a second ago on plugging you into the money. So we have upcoming the next live event. It's called the Real Estate Cash Flow Conference. And at the event, we have private lenders at the event that you can network with. There are actually uh, about a dozen of my own personal private lenders you get to network with. Um, at the conference, we, I teach myself, I'm doing the training, teach you how we find deals before other real estate investors even know they exist, uh, how we sell any house in three days or less, how we automate the business. We'll be going on a, a really amazing bus tour where we actually go out and look at the houses uh, that we uh, are either rehabbing or they may not need rehab. You get to meet uh, the members of our team that automates the business, our interior designer, contractors, uh, the real estate, uh, the realtors we work with, uh, our real estate attorney is actually coming to the upcoming live event. So you want to go to the website right here below my fingers. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening on iTunes, here it is www.jayconner.com -E forward slash money podcast. Go check it out and get registered. That's www.jayconner.com forward slash money podcast. And we'll look forward to seeing you at the event. And speaking of the upcoming live event, my special guest I have with me here on the show today is Chaffee Wynn. And hello, Chaffee. Welcome to the show. Hello, Jay. Hello, hello. And speaking of the live event, Chaffee Wynn is at all of my live events. Uh, he is the uh, lead coach and strategist that will sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and uh, review with you where you are with your business, whether you're brand new, never done a deal before, you've done a lot of deals and help take your business to the next level, help you overcome whatever blocks and challenges, challenges you're dealing with. So Chaffee, um, you've been on a number of shows with us since uh, we launched and wow, I was just reviewing the numbers. Our number of, uh, viewers are growing amazingly fast. And uh, so anyway, it's exciting to have you back here on the show. Welcome. I'm always excited to be here, Jay. Um, so Chaffee, what are we going to talk about today? Well, you know, I was thinking at the, uh, the last boot camp that we just had um, a few weeks ago, um, there were actually quite a few students that were there uh, because they were tired of using hard money. And so I thought we'd talk about the differences between hard money and private money this week. And I know you're the expert in private money. You're the private money authority. So let's go into maybe start off with what's the difference between the two. And then you can tell us maybe some things uh, why people should start using private money instead of hard money. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, let's do it because there's a lot of misconceptions out there. Uh, even understanding what, what is private money. And what is hard money? I mean, what I've heard over the years, a lot of times when a real estate investor or someone hears about, oh, there's a, there's private, there's a place that you can get private money. What's really being advertised or promoted are hard money brokers. All right. So a private, a private lender, okay, is an individual, just like you, just like me, it's an individual, it's a human being. It's not an institution. It's not a bank. It's not a mortgage company. It's an individual, a private lender is an individual that loans to the real estate investor money from either their investment capital or from their retirement account. Um, and that reminds me, Chavi, 
we should really do a show on just working with self-directed IRAs <laughs> and, and how important that is. I don't think I've done a show. I just on, mentioned that before though. <laughs> just on that piece. So, um, so Scott, who is my executive producer here for the show, I know he's listening in the background. Scott, please make a big note. In fact, I should just make that the next show. All right. Um, how to work with self directed IRA. So private money is, is working with individuals, all right? Hard money lenders are in most cases brokers, right? So what a hard money lender will do is, is they will go raise capital from individuals, from private lenders, and will then mark the money up and et cetera. Um, and so the hard money lender is making money on money. So they're a broker of money. So a hard money lender in most cases is a middle person, middle man, middle woman that is standing in between us, the real estate investor, borrower, and the source of the funding, which are the private money lenders. And so, as you know, Chappie, you know, uh, what, what I do and what I teach is how to circumvent the hard money lender and attract and locate and go directly to the source, to these individuals that will loan us money. So right now, Chaffee, um, I have 48, I believe it is, have 48 private lenders that are funding uh, our real estate investing business. And by the way, viewers and listeners, you don't need 48 private lenders. Okay. <laughs> Starting out, you need like one or two, right? Hey, Jay, I, I want to uh, clarify something if I could, um, by actually asking you a question about your private money lenders. Are any of your private money lenders uh, professional or uh, real estate investors? Do any of them actively invest in real estate? Yeah, I'm glad you asked because what these 48 private lenders look like uh, is really interesting. So none of them are real estate investors. None of them want to be real estate investors. <laughs> they're not interested in locating, you know, they're not only interested in doing what, what we do and what our viewers and listeners are interested in doing. They want the passive income. Um, and you know, interestingly enough, well, I guess I should be, I should be clear on this point, Chappie, as we're talking about what's the difference between private lenders and hard money lenders. There's really three, three main categories or I call it piles of money. There's really three main categories as to where these private lenders are, if you will. The first category is what we call our warm market. So the warm market are people that we have some kind of relationship with, you know, they're in our cell phone, they're on the Christmas card list, et cetera. They're in our social network, et cetera. So people we've got some kind of relationship with. The second category uh, and my platinum members really get plugged into this is okay. How can you expand your current warm market? What, what new warm markets can you go to or become involved in that will really expand your network and have more uh, potential private lenders to do business with? And the third category of private lenders are what I call existing private lenders. They're individuals, not institutions, not banks, not mortgage companies, but they are existing private lenders. And we locate those people actually from public record. Uh, and we get, and we get their contact information, et cetera. And of course I've got a system on how you contact those people and communicate with them. And so those are people that are already doing it. They're already, you know, learning money out, but those are the three main categories, if you will. And, uh, that's the, well, I guess what we should do Chavi, since, since we want to talk about this is lay out all these different reasons as to why a real estate investor would want to do business with a private lender versus a hard money lender. And, and I want to just, uh, again, uh, reiterate uh, what your answer was, which is all of your private lenders aren't 
or are not active investors. And the reason I bring that up is sometimes you'll go to a RIA club or a meeting somewhere and somebody will present them as a themselves as a private lender when they're actually a hard money lender or they're charging hard money rates or hard money fees and everything. So as we go through these uh, differences that you're going to talk about, and you know, keep that in mind is that you're looking for somebody who um, wants to be, as you said, uh, that passive income versus an active real estate investor looking for, you know, points and higher rates of returns and all that kind of stuff. So, right. Well, and you know, I'm a private lender too. I enjoy both sides of the coin. I use my retirement funds uh, to loan out to real estate investors. And what's, you know, I know we'll talk about this in another show, but the really cool thing about using the retirement funds as money to lend to a real estate investor is that first of all, now of course it's got to be transferred to an IRS approved self-directed IRA company. All right. So we'll talk about all that in, in the show that we, that we talk about that. But the cool thing is that the private lender, when they're using their retirement funds, there's no limit to the money that they can make per year tax free and penalty free. You know, um, when, when you've got your retirement funds in like a traditional uh, place, such as, you know, in the stock market or mutual funds, or with your plan administrator, if you have a 401k and you're working at a company or whatever, then, you know, I mean, we've got one private lender last year that made $65,000 tax free by using their retirement funds to loan to us. So, you know, as we said, we'll, we'll talk about the retirement funds in a, in an upcoming show very soon. Um, so yeah. A any other preliminary information you think we need to give out on private money versus hard money before we dive in? Uh, no, I, I think let's just dive right in and get to those points. All right. So here's 10 reasons why you want to use private money versus hard money or what's the differences. First of all, Chaffee is the interest rate, right? Mm -hmm. So I recently checked the average interest rate. It's all over the board. I mean, some hard money lenders charge over 20%. All right. Crazy. But the average interest rate right now across the board is 14%. 14% is your average hard money lender rate to a real estate investor. Okay. Private money right now, I pay my private lenders 8% which is fantastic, right? I mean, that's a very, very high rate of return, particularly when, you know, a 12 month CD certificate of deposit is right now, well, last time I checked was last week, it's like on average 0.82% in a 12 month certificate of deposit. So you pay a private lender 8%, that's, that's, that's a great rate of return, but it's not 14%, all right? So that's the interest rate, all right? And by the way, when we're speaking of interest rates, um, most of the time on my deals, I pay interest only. And interest only is a win-win for the private lender and for us, the real estate investor as the borrower. It helps our cash flow. Obviously, interest only payments are less monthly or whatever how often you pay them versus principal and interest. And the private lender uh, prefers interest only because if you're paying principal and interest, then you're paying down part of the principal amount, which means they don't have all of their money at work on the deal. So all their principal stays uh, invested in the deal. And so here's the writer downer. The private lender, uh, the principal remains the same until cash out. Okay. Another thing I want to clarify Chaffee here at the, on the very front end, as far as our relationship with the private lender, the private lender does not own the property. Okay. So we're not talking about a joint venture arrangement, arrangement uh, or relationship when we're talking private money and private lenders. The private lender acts in the same capacity as a bank, right? So they're going to get the same protection as a bank or mortgage company would, i.e., get the promissory note, the mortgage deed of trust in North Carolina and some other states, you know, named as the mortgagee on the insurance policy, named as the additional insured on the title policy. 
but the private lender does not own the property. You or me, the real estate investor, the borrower, our entity, your land trust, your LLC, whatever, how you're doing your business owns the property. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, as, as you know, we've ta actually uh, talked to um, a hard money lender type person that actually wants to own the property while you're working on it. And then when everything's done and you sell the property, they'll transfer the title to you. Only yeah, again, you know, with private lenders, you don't have that challenge. Exactly. So that's the interest rate. Uh, number two out of 10 are points or origination fees. So let's be clear. A point is, or an origination fee is just, just really more interest for mm -hmm. the lender to make. It's just called something different. So I'm sure, I'm sure all of our listeners and viewers know what points. What, or origination is, what is are. a point? Just, just, just yeah. be clear. Yeah. So a point or origination fee is, so let's say that, let's say the lender's charging four points. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which by the way, that's the national average for hard money loans, four points. What that means is, you're going to multiply your uh, principal loan amount that you're borrowing times those number of points or percentage points, if you will. So if it's four points and you're borrowing a hundred thousand dollars, a hundred thousand times four points or 4% is $4,000. So that's so, on top of the 14% you're going to pay them for that loan, right, Jay? So exactly. So now in the first 12 months, we're up to 18% right. on average. Right on hard money, and a point. You also have the uh, obligation, and not the pleasure, the obligation of bringing that origination fee or points to the closing up front when you buy. Here's the beautiful thing about private money: there are no points, there are no origination fees. In the millions and millions that I've borrowed of private money, never paid a point never paid uh, origination fees. So I'm paying my private lenders, as I said a moment ago, 8%, all right? So just so far between the interest rate, average interest rate on a hard money lender of 14% and four points, I'm now up in the first year of 18%. I'm still at 8%, okay, with private money. Number three, Chavi, are extension fees. So what's an extension fee or what's an extension? Well, most hard money loans, the, in fact, I'll go and talk about number four as well, simultaneously, the fourth reason, the length of a promissory note on most hard money loans is either six months or a year. Most of them, most of them are six months. Some are a year. All right. Well, if you have an, and, and with private money, it ranges between two and five years, two years if it's investment capital, five years if it's retirement funds. So if the, you have not cashed out on a, on borrowing money from a hard money lender in six months or a year, if you've made your payments on time, yeah, they will extend your note. But what do they want? More money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, the average extension fee right now is 2%. So if you borrowed a hundred thousand dollars, and you haven't cashed out in six months. If you've got a six month note, now that's two more points. So you got to pay another $2,000 on top of the 14% and on top of the 4% that you already paid six months ago, you got now to pay another 2%, uh, another 2000 bucks. So now within your first year, you're up to 20% your first year with hard money, private money. There are no extension fees. All right. Now your private money lender is going to want to extend because they don't want their money back. If you haven't cashed out, because where else are they going to get, you know, a high rate of return safely and securely. Right. So length of the note, as I said, six months, hard money, one year, hard money, two to five years on private money. That's the first four interest rate points, extension fees, and the length of the note. Number five, this is a big one, Chavi. down payments. Okay. Oh, yeah. I mean, what kind of a down payment does a hard money lender require? Well, the average right now is 20%, regardless of how good the deal is. Now, some will only advance 65% of your purchase price, 
which means you got to come up with 35% of your purchase price down payment. So regardless of how good the deal is in the world of hard money, you got to come up with a big down payment right up when you're purchasing. The beautiful thing folks about private money is that you get 100% of your purchase price, which means zero down payment, zero down payment. Now, Let's hey, begin, Jake. Can I just add too? Is that the hard money lenders? They want that down payment to come from you, so they don't want you go borrowing that thirty-five percent or twenty percent from somebody else in addition to their their hard money. They want it to come from you, so that you have skin in the game, as they call it. Um, and, and so you know, you can't go and get a second mortgage or a second loan or loans from somebody else. You have to have that yourself. Exactly. Exactly. And also I want us to be really, really clear on when to use private money. And it's simple. You're going to use private money to fund your deals when the seller is requiring all the cash. They're requiring all the money up front. So why do I bring that up? Well, I've got friends that teach that, you know, uh, just to use creative ways to control and buy real estate without having to pay cash for it. Well, in reviewing thousands of motivated seller lead sheets, I've discovered that on average, only 13% of for sale by owners or FISBOs will sell creatively, which means only 13% of them will sell to you, you know, with owner financing or uh, subject to the existing note, uh, or on lease option, you know, all these creative ways that we can control real estate. Now, if I can control it with buying it subject to, which I, I bought a number of deals subject to, I'm going to go that route. But when the other 87% are requiring all the money at closing, I'm not going to miss out on any deals because I don't have the funding or the money lined up. Makes sense, Chevy? Absolutely. And let me throw in there too, Jay, if you're going the traditional route with bankers, right? You can only borrow so many properties and you run out of money. And so exactly. you get uh, equity rich, even though you have a ton of equity, you're cash poor, you have no more money. You can't get any more loans from banks and same things with, uh, actually, I think that might be one of your points. I'm jumping ahead, so I'll stop. No, that's okay, but you, you said something that's really important though. Uh, it, you know, if we've got any viewers or listeners here that are equity rich and cash poor, or you just got a bunch of equity and properties and you want to just, you want some liquidity, you want to pull some cash out. Well, my lens, private money is the perfect way to go. If you've got a free and clear property or equity, you don't have to be free and clear using private money. It does not have to be free and clear. You just got to have equity. You want to pull some cash out then use a private lender and you can, and you can use a private lender in multiple, multiple positions, which that's, going, that's another reason of differences. But uh, since you've mentioned the equity versus cash, private money is a great, you don't have to use private money to just purchase a property. You can use private money to move that equity or some of your equity into a liquid position. And, and that's a key point. Cause I talked to somebody that uh, had 12 properties and, um, um, had no job because she was an investor. And so yep. none of the banks would loan her because she had no W-2 income. And right. so she couldn't get a loan. She couldn't refinance. And, uh, and so she ended up, uh, you know, having to learn how to use private money to pull some of that cash out. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm glad we thought of that and didn't leave that out. So down payments, as I said, you know, 100% advance when you purchase, you don't have to reach into your pocket. The sixth reason, Chappy, um, that comes to mind, the difference between hard money and private money is, and this is one of my favorite reasons for using private money, is in the world of private money, we get to receive multiple checks on every transaction, on every deal that we do. I mean, my word, the only check I know that you receive when you're using hard money to borrow is when you sell the house right? The difference between what you sell it for and what you owe the hard money lender, right? Well, I'm going to lay out right now a way that people, and I do it myself, can get, can receive three different checks on, on a deal 
without having to bring any money, without having you having to write any checks or bring any money to the closing table. The first check you receive is when you buy. So I always borrow more than I need to purchase the property, even if there's no rehab involved. And by the way, you'll use private money in what we call the pretty house business. When first of all, they won't sell to you on terms. And secondly, even if there's no rehab needed in the pretty house business, you'll use the private money to fund it. But I always borrow more than I need. There's always marketing costs on every house. There's carrying costs on every house. And Chaffee, I always uh, figure, even if I can't find anything wrong with the house, it's absolutely beautiful, ready to go. I throw in a $5,000 minimum repair on every house in calculating my maximum offer because Murphy lives in every house. Tell our viewers and listeners who Murphy is, just in case they don't know. <laughs> Professor Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> is uh, when, when something uh, looks uh, right, uh, he'll show up and make sure that it's not. <laughs> That's it. There's always unexpected surprises and oops, if you will. So that's the first check, borrow more than I need to buy. Second check, if you're going to sell the property on rent, rent to own or a lease purchase program, you'll get a non-refundable uh, option fee. Sometimes we call it a lease option deposit. So that's your second check. If you sell it on rent to own, then whether you're selling on rent to own or not, when the buyer is ready for cash out, I mean, they've got their mortgage in place. Then your final check is of course, the difference between what you sell it and what you still owe the private lender. So many, many times, I mean, just last week, I got an $8,000 non-refundable option fee from the rent to own buyer and the house is selling for, uh, $129,900. And so that's a very, you know, common non-refundable option fee that we get. So multiple checks. And, and I think that's, uh, again, that's a critical point is that you get, you know, when you buy, you get a check because with some hard money lenders, even if they're willing to lend on the rehab part, they'll do it in draws. And so you have to keep going back and forth to them all the time and communicating them your progress. It's just another step that you got to take care of in order to get money just to finish any rehab that might uh, you might have to do if you're using hard money. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I'm closing on, uh, I'm buying two houses, at least two houses next week. Uh, both of them went under contract uh, within the last couple of days. That's another good, oh my word. That's another big difference that I, now I have more than 10 reasons <laughs> for private money versus hard money. So I'll just go ahead and throw this one out. And that is uh, I'm able to close so quickly. Oh my word. I make all of my offers. I can close within seven days, right? Hard money lender can't move that fast. Okay. Right. A hard money lender can move faster typically than a traditional mortgage company uh, or, you know, banker or whatever, but they can't move within seven days. Um, and that's, and that's the reason, I got both of these deals under contract, but one of them is a major rehab. It is a gut job. It got uh, really, really bad damage from hurricane Florence that came through here. Well, I'm buying a house next week, Chaffee, and I'm getting a $50,000 check when I buy next week. Who wants to get paid to buy houses? There now, of course, I'm not going to get a $50,000 check when I buy, unless there's going to be a major rehab, right? Right. You know, I'm not going to be, I'm not, who wants to pay interest on that money when I don't need that money unless it's a major rehab, but nonetheless. Hey, hey Jay, I, I, I don't want to get too far off topic, except, you know, you brought up a good point that I want to reiterate is that uh, we talked to a lot of wholesalers and wholesalers, their typical MO is they'll do, uh, they'll make an offer that uh, they'll close within 30 days. And after that 30 days, if they haven't found a buyer at that time, then they have to give the deal back to the seller and they look like mud because you know they tied it up for 30 days and they couldn't do anything with it or or they're frantically running around asking everybody and anybody to buy the property for them only when you have a private lender and you're doing the real estate business the right way you can close in seven days and you have that confidence to know that hey even if this is a wholesale and i can't find a buyer in seven days or whatever I can just buy that property and take my time and find the right buyer for it and flip that property and make some money. So Absolutely. having that private money 
uh, in hand allows you to do that with full confidence versus, you know, going the traditional route or using a hard money lender or not even having the money. Oh, in my land. Yes. I mean, you know, you just said the word confidence. I mean, yes. so let me just say this now to all of our viewers and listeners. Let me ask the question. How much more confident would you be in making offers or how much more confident will you be when making offers and you've got 250,000 or $500,000 burning a hole in your pocket <laughs> to go make some offers, you know? And Chef, you've heard me teach it time and time again. That's why I teach the money comes first. In other words, we focus, we get the, we focus I mean, there's always going to be deals, always going to be deals, right? And, you know, I just, I'm not interested in being stressed out to go get a property under contract and the seller's requiring all the funding. And I have no idea where it's going to come from. Right. On the other hand, I got the money lined up, ready to go from the private lender or private lenders. I'm making offers confidently. I know where the funding's coming from and I can confidently make that, that offer to close in seven days because I got the funding ready to go. Right. So next reason I want to use private money instead of hard money is there's no credit check, no credit check. And when you're using private money, most hard money lenders will pull your credit and look at it. So the bottom line is, you know, you can have a mid score of 425, which is pretty low, right? It doesn't matter what your credit score is. And here, and here's the deal. And here's why, because in the world of private money, this is a collateral loan, right? Not a traditional loan where you're, you know, getting your credit check. It's a collateral loan. Every deal stands on its own. So your credit's got absolutely nothing to do with it, which ties into the, to the eighth reason. And that is verification of income. Your verification of income has got nothing to do with getting the private money. Again, it's because it's a collateral loan and it's not your personal income or your credit that's getting you to qualify for the loan. And Jay, I can't tell you how many students I've talked to that will tell me, you know, I talked to this hard money lender and they want to run a credit check on me. Well, sure. they're not a true hard money lender and you can avoid all that by using private money. So, you know, hard money lenders today call themselves hard money lenders, except they require all these extra steps and all these extra things that, you know, you just don't need to take care of or do when you're using private money. That's right. That's right. Uh, so credit verification of income. The ninth reason to use private money instead of hard money is the number of deals you can do simultaneously. You know, uh, for sure, if you're using traditional lenders, most hard money lenders have got a limit to the number of deals that you can have going on simultaneously. All right. In this wonderful world of private money, there is no limit to the number of deals you can be doing. And there's no limit to the number of private lenders that you can be doing business with. And that brings up another point too, Chavi, just as a side point that's important. And that is private lenders can be anywhere. So we're not limited to just doing business with private lenders in the same state that we're in. We can, I mean, I've got private lenders in 10 different states, all right? So the reason we can borrow across state lines from individuals is because we are not regulated by the commissioner of banks, all right? The commissioner of banks regulates banks and mortgage companies, et cetera on where they can do business, but we are not regulated since we are individuals doing business with other individuals. Make sense? Yeah. Do, do we have time for a funny story? Sure. <laughs> so I was I talking, have time for a funny story. I was, I was talking to the student and uh, they, um, they live in uh, North Carolina and uh, I was talking to them about raising private money. Right. And they're originally from New York and they had just moved to North Carolina within the past year. So they were still building their base in North Carolina. And so they thought, you know, we're going to raise some money in New York because we know people in New York. So we'll, you know, we have some contacts up there. We'll reach out to them. We'll raise private money. And then I asked them, well, what about going to, you know, your local uh, chamber of commerce or, you know, a local me meeting that uh, you can meet some business owners and raise some money. And they're like, well, you know, the closest one is, is about an hour, a little bit over an hour away. It's a little too far for us. 
<laughs> like, wait a second. They're like, you know, it's too far. We can't raise private money because it's too far. And and so in their head, they're like thinking that it was over an hour away, so it was too far. And yet they were going to go to New York and raise private money <laughs> because they knew people in New York. So <laughs> that's fun. Oh, once, once I, you know, got their head straight, they're like, yeah, you got a point. <laughs> so my lands, mercy. All right, so that was number nine. Number 10 reason to use private money instead of hard money is lean position. So here's what, what I mean by that. So hard money lenders want to be in first position. So using the hard money to purchase. So I've got a number of private lenders that have smaller amounts of money to loan out, like $25,000, $30,000 in that range. Well, I can't buy a property, right? With I mean, there are some areas in North Carolina, you actually can buy a house for 25 or $30,000. But anyway, I can use that money and for in a second position or a junior lien position for like the rehab or whatever. A well, hard money lender is not going to work with you like that. They're going to be in first position only. In the world of private money, like if you buy a house subject to the existing note or, you know, you buy it with seller financing or whatever, and you still need some money for marketing costs, carrying costs, maybe some rehab or whatever, you can borrow money from a private lender and give them and put them in second position or a junior lien position. Um, and, but here's the catch. You've got to disclose to them what position they're in. Okay. That's on the promissory note. Uh, and you want to protect your private lenders and not borrow more than 75% of the total loan to value. So here's the definition of total loan to value. You add up both notes, both amounts that are borrowed, both principal loan amounts, add them together, divide it by the after repaired value of the house, and you don't want to exceed 75%. So for example, let's say you have a, a house that's got an after repaired value of $200,000. Let's say you have one note from a private lender in first position at 100,000 then you could have up to um, a, a second note up to $50,000 in second position. You add both notes together, 100,000 plus the 50 equals 150,000 divided by the after repair value of 200,000. The total loan to value or total notes divided by the value is not exceeding 75%. So uh, does that make sense, Chavi? Yeah, and I, I think you brought up the key point there. If, if uh, a lot of people do like the creative financing methods using yeah. subject to or something like that, and and with private money, even though you're buying a property subject to the existing mortgage, as long as the equity or the loan to value is still there, you can put in a private lender for any rehabs if you're just doing carpet and paint, making it pretty, um, or, or you know, slight rehabs to uh, make the house pretty so that you can turn around and either put in a lease option tenant or, you know, turn around and sell it if you want to. So you can't do that with hard money. Like you said, you can't do that with banks because they also want um, that, uh, that first position lean. Exactly. Exactly. Chaffee, I got a bonus reason. So I said 10 initially. Uh, so here's, here's a bonus. More 10. <laughs> okay, it seems like it. So here's the bonus is that, in the world of private money, when you're dealing with your warm market, you make the rules. So when I was borrowing money from the banks, uh, they made the rules. I mean, they set the interest rate. They told me how often I made the payments, you know? Um, and in this world of private money, particularly working with your warm market, it's your private lending program. You set the interest rate, you set the frequency of payments and et cetera. So, you know, in this world of private money, I've never chased anybody. I've never begged. I've never tried to talk anybody into anything. I just make my program available. Okay. And then those that are interested, you know, they, they in fact, I've never asked anybody for money. Never asked anybody for money. Make the program available. If they're interested, then they're going to tell you what they got and, and you know what they want to do. So I tell you the thing that comes to mind, Chavi is for our viewers and listeners, if they really want to dive deep in this subject of private money and et cetera, along with learning how we do the business, everybody for sure. In fact, Scott, one more time, 
put it up right here on the screen for those that are watching on uh, YouTube, www.jayconner.com -E forward slash money podcast. Go there to that website and check out the upcoming live event because we really, really dive deep, both Chaffee and I, uh, on this subject that we've been talking about here on the show. Final comments, Chavi. Uh, Jay, I think, uh, you know, you'd be crazy not to start pursuing private money if you're uh, in this business, as you always say, and, and I'm a firm believer of this too, is get the money first. Um, learn how to do it the right way. Uh, come, to the, come to the live event. Um, get your course, where to get the money now. Figure out how to do it the right way. And as you said, you're in control with your own program when you know how to do it the right way. Um, and, and you could use this in so many different ways and so many different aspects of your business. I've been there where I was stuck because I was equity rich and cash poor, didn't know what to do. This is a solution for that. So start using private money, start raising private money, start raising it the J way. Awesome. Well, Chavi, thank you so much uh, for joining me here on the show. Once again, it's always a pleasure to have you on. And again, to all of our viewers and listeners, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, be sure and subscribe and leave your comments or questions below. We'll be sure and get all your questions answered. Uh, and if you're listening on iTunes, then for sure, subscribe and uh, rate and review. So thank you all listeners and viewers for tuning in to another episode here on uh, Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. Great to have you on. And uh, be sure not miss out on the upcoming show. We'll be talking about self-directed IRAs. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, uh, wishing you all the best and working with you to take your business to the next level. Bye for now.